Jeremy Tyner. Amen. How about we have got a hand clap of praise in this house? Amen. I tell you what, as far as if you were playing Oasis bingo, drug deal, pickleball, donuts. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying. This is why this is why our leadership can't leave because it's just you, it's just you and I today, homie. That's it. We're missing like sixty seven percent of our staff, uh, so I don't think we can be held accountable or responsible for what I said across this pulpit today. And if y'all don't mind just keeping within house, you know that's that's great. But I definitely want to tie into what Pastor Charles was talking about as far as with consecration starting uh, next Sunday. This is going to be big and. And it's, it's, we're just asking everybody as far as like, even if you, we're not asking, as you said, we're not asking to do the, the whole 10 days. We're not asking, you know, every minute as far as but we're, what we are asking is just carve out some time because these next 10 days, starting next Sunday is our, the future of Oasis will be shaped by it. And the, the heaviness that's on our bishop's heart to, to do this and to launch this. This isn't because we're bored and it's not because we're doing a new right. building. It's not because it's, it's typical the time of year that we do this. So this, is, this was placed on the heart of our bishop. Uh, and so whenever something like that happens, there's a reason for it. And so there's going to have some videos that's going to be released this week, uh, some more information so you guys can lean into that. But just circle on your calendar. We're just asking if, if you have some plans that you can just reschedule every once in a while, but just really try to make it a priority to be here as much as you can uh, during that time. But it's good to be back to see everybody. It's good to be back to see everyone. I, I, okay, for the three people that's glad I'm back, thank you. <laughs> Dear Lord in heaven. What did I do? I haven't said anything yet. Usually people get offended around the 15 minute mark, not before in my introduction. <laughs> uh, so two weeks ago, my wife and I uh, went to Michigan to minister and it was an amazing time. It's their Super Bowl Sunday. It's their friends and family day. And they had so many guests and the, the church was packed out with, with visitors. And, and we experienced 23 salvations that Sunday. That was insane. 23 salvations. Um, and talking with the pastor, he's like, there, there wasn't a single person here uh, that was saved that goes here. These are all first time guests and visitors. So give God praise for that. That's just an absolute amazing thing. And then my wife and I got to leave and just spend some time and, and on a vacation. Um, I had to work a little bit. She had a ball. Uh, but as far as we never, as far as like when we go out of town, it's never boring. I like guess it's, it's never boring. There's always going to be something happen. And uh, like this time we almost got stranded in the Caribbean. And I, no one will ever convince me otherwise. This was a catamaran, a boat, ran by the cartel. I don't care what anyone, no, no one will ever convince me other, other than that. But uh, we were almost stranded because they got this motor off of Wish, I think it was, or something. <laughs> Because this motor was not working whatsoever, and uh, but we are back, we're alive, <laughs> praise Jesus. Uh, but man, yeah. So then uh, Bishop asked, as far as if I could uh, take today, and um, I think sometimes he asked me to preach when I'm on vacation to keep me uh, focused, uh, to keep me saved, perhaps. <laughs> Um, just because I know I'm preaching on Sunday, but we're going to go to Second King chapter number five. But before we go there, uh, there's just like some, there's a buildup. There's some things I want to get to before we get to our text this morning, because before we get to uh, chapter five, we have chapter four of, of Second Kings. And it's the story of the widow where Elisha meets the, this widow and she had a lot of debt and she had a little bit of oil and she tells Elisha that, and so Elisha says, hey, just go and go borrow as many vessels as you can and take the oil that you have and keep pouring into all the vessels, and then what you have filled, then go sell them and then pay off your debt that way. And so that right there was what prevented her kids from being sold off into slavery or the debt master to take her children. Also in that same chapter is where Elisha runs into a Shumanite woman where this woman was so full of love and grace that she built a room specifically for Elisha because he will come and travel and so she built a room and Elisha said well what can I do for you to repay this because your your generosity is is unmatched what can I do and and the woman said why well, I, I don't have a son and you have to understand back in those days if you were uh, because she was married to an old man nothing wrong with age gaps but she was kind of nervous in those days because if her husband would have died 
the the brothers the of the husband would take over the property and everything else and she would be left with nothing and so she needed a son someone to inherit the things that they had and so Elisha prophesied said you know they're going to have a son and then she had a son the baby dies and the, the boy dies and so Elisha comes back and resurrects the child and it's the first resurrection recorded in the Bible, which is, I think is amazing how someone can do something that they've never done before, they've never seen it. That's, that's the beauty of a miracle, is you trust in God to do something you've never yourself ever seen done. So how did he know it was even possible? But when you believe a God that's that big, that can do all things, then all of a sudden you be, take the limitations off. Even though you've never seen it, you believe God can still do it. And so, and then in chapter number five, the beginning of it, we, I preached about this, I think two months ago, it felt like two years, two months ago, there's the story of Naaman when he had leprosy and he came to Elisha and, and he brought gold and he brought silver and he brought some clothes. Um, and it was valued at today's value, $5.5 million. If you take all the gold and silver he brought, because when you don't understand the grace of God, you think something has to be earned or something has to be paid for. So he thinks to be cured of this leprosy is going to cost me something. So he brought $5.5 million in today's value of things. And Elisha refused the payment. And, and, and he sent Naaman to, be, to go dip himself in the Jordan. Naaman was healed of this leprosy. But Elisha had a servant named Gehazi, or Gehazi, depends how you want to pronounce it. Just today, I don't want to be corrected on the pronunciation. You're way smarter than I am. I'm going to call him Gehazi, and if I get it wrong, he'll correct me in heaven later. I don't think it's a deal breaker. I hope I'm not losing credibility if, you, if I'm pronouncing his name wrong. Just say for the three people that's glad I'm back, we're even. Either way, <laughs> that was rough. I'm, I'm going to be 97 years old to remember, remember that. But Gehazi, as far as he came up with the story, because he, he didn't understand how Elisha could send this man back to Syria because he was an enemy of Israel and he was having a hard time understanding how can he send him back with all this gold and all this silver and all these Air Jordan 1 retros and how, how is he sending him back without actually taking anything? And so Gehazi had this, now I'm saying, now I'm all over the place. Is it Gehazi or Gehazi? Whatever. G. Yeah, you beat me too. I was going to say G. <laughs> it's going to be a kind of a day. I love it. So he came up with this idea. I'm going to go after him. I'm going to get me a pair of Jordans. I'm going to get me some gold, some silver. I'm going to figure something out. And it says in verse number 23 of chapter 5, once he gets to Naaman, because he yells down Naaman, Naaman sees him coming. He gets off his chariot. In verse 23, and Naaman said, be pleased to accept two talents because Gehazi said, hey, I, I need some gold. I need some silver for these guys, for Elisha. Came up with the story. And Naaman said, he urged him and tied up two talents of silver into two bags and with two changes of clothes and laid them on two of his servants. And they carried them before Gehazi. Then he came to the hill and he took them from their hand and put them in the house. He hid them. Everybody say he hid them. He hid them and he sent the men away and then they parted. I don't know what it is, but sometimes we're very convenient and we are very uh, uh, knowledgeable and experienced about hiding things in our bedrooms. Um, I think we learned that as a very young age. My kids growing up were professionals walking in their room and you think the room is spotless. Just don't open up the closet door. Don't look under the bed. Don't look behind the dresser. As a matter of fact, don't look anywhere. And I think as, as children, we grow from trying to hide the, the mess to get away from our parents. As adults, we grow, we try to hide things from the father. It's just the bedroom turns into our hearts and our minds and our souls. And he went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said to him, where have you been, Ghazi? And he said, your servant went nowhere. Could you imagine? Not just, not just the audacity, but the... The bravery. This man is a prophet. I wouldn't lie to my grandma Nene because I know what would happen to me, let alone lie to Elisha. And he says, where, where, he says your servant went nowhere. And he said to him, did, did not my heart go when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Was it a time to accept money and garments olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen and male servants and female servants. You see what he's doing? He's speaking to the heart of his servant because he's like, if you were to get some money, get some gold, these were the things that you would buy. 
You would transition this gold and silver into buying servants or vineyards or sheep or oxen. And he says, therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever. When he says to your descendants at this time, Gehazi had kids. So it says, so he went from his presence a leper like snow. Now you have to understand leprosy was a skin disease that would gradually eat your body. He would walk in on Tuesday with a little spot and come back on a Friday and it's grown, but now you're missing an ear. It's just, it, it's, it just takes over and it just shuts down your body. So we're going to talk about this morning, radical redemption, radical redemption. And so redemption itself is just deliverance from sin and its consequences. Everyone that has, an, has come into a, a relationship with the Father, those that have met Christ have been redeemed. We have been redeemed by his blood. We have been redeemed by Calvary. The things that we should be punished for, our past faults and our past failures, our sins of that we have done, not just yesterday, but last week, last month, even when we were kids, we have been freed from that punishment. We have been justified with our faith. We've been justified through Calvary. And so we talk about redemption and, and, and how it's a radical redemption as far as going to the cross to save us, to redeem us was radical. We were radically redeemed. And so we think about how we need redemption. A lot of the times we think that we are unredeemable because of our past. You don't know what I did when I was a teenager or, or you don't know what I did in my previous marriage. You, you don't understand what I've done in my past, even though I might be forgiven by some people. There's no way. There's no way I can walk in the true purpose and true calling in my life based on what I've done. Because the scripture tells me after that I'm going to reap what I sow and I've sowed all kinds of stuff in my prior life. And so there's no way I'm going to be able to be able to be completely justified and walk in purpose and strength and holiness because of what I've done. And I think a lot of times we want to skip over those memories. We want to skip over those things that we have done. And, and I look at it as like a movie because a lot of times, you know, we want to skip over a boring scene or we want to skip over a gruesome scene or we want to skip. Well, we shouldn't be watching those movies anyway. But if we want to skip over certain parts of the movie because we don't like it. We don't like what we're seeing. But then oftentimes that we will skip over something and then the story picks back up and we have no idea what's going on. So just because you don't like the scene, it doesn't mean you skip it because you're going to ruin the story. You have a story and there's some scenes and there's some chapters in your life that you may not like, but you can't skip it because it's a part of your story. Your story has value, your story has meaning, and your story has a purpose. And just because you're ashamed of it, you regret it, and you wish it never happened, you can't skip over it. Because you're pulling out a chapter, and if you pull out a chapter, the, ch the whole book becomes undone. So even though there's mistakes, there's still a value and your pain, there's so value in, 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 in what you have done because we can't, just because we don't like this scene, we can't skip the story until I take Moses. Moses was 40 years old and he killed a man. And then he fled off into the wilderness and he was there for 40 years. It was 80 years when he got called back to Egypt to release the bonded people of Israel. Now, he would have loved to assume to skip over the point where he murdered somebody. And I'm sure he would love to skip over the 40 years of being a shepherd and doing nothing. But he had to go through those scenes to get to where God was calling him to free his people. Take Joseph, who was abandoned by his brothers. I'm sure Joseph would love to skip the scene when he was falsely imprisoned. I would, I would assume that Joseph would love to skip the scene when he was thrown into a pit. But you see, you, could, you can't take those scenes out because all those scenes add up to him going to Egypt to redeem and to, to make sure the people of Israel are saved in the famine. Even Jesus Christ himself, a lot of us would want to skip over Calvary. The pain and torture and punishment that he went through. You see, because he was crucified on Friday, Satan partied on, on Saturday, but then Resurrection Sunday came. You see, we can't skip over the scene of Calvary to get to the empty tomb. And so it will create a gap in your story if we skip over it. 
So a part of where we are today and where I'm speaking to is the fact that we might have gone through some things that we wish we would regret. And if you're new here or if you never met Jesus, I'm sure that you're sitting here thinking, I, you don't, be, brother, you don't even know my story. You don't know what I've gone through and you don't know where I've done it. You're right. I don't know. But guess what? You don't know mine either. And I can tell you as far as that there is a father who loves me enough, but he picked me up of all my mess. And I have known people who the world would assume would be unredeemable. That they're now leading crusades. They're, they're preaching in prisons and, and, and everything else. And so just because you don't like the story, you don't skip it. And then we go to chapter number six. And so we have Naaman, we have the, the, the Gazi, he leaves. Now we're in chapter six. And now there's another, Israel's at war again. I swear, Israel's at war again. It's chapter six, and now Syria sets siege around Samaria, the capital of Israel. There's a siege around the city of Samaria, and a siege means there's a blockade. It means nothing goes in, and nothing comes out. If nothing can come in, that means you're going to run out of food. You're going to run out of water. You're going to run out of things. So if, if food and nourishment can't come in, that means you're not sending stuff out to sell. So no money coming in, no food coming in, and everything is falling apart at the seams. So much so that the rich were buying heads of donkeys to eat. I'm pretty sure they serve that at Golden Corral. I don't know for, <laughs> don't, don't take me at my word for it. Don't, no, 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 don't take me at my word for it. I'm just, I, that's what I've heard. That's what I've heard. Don't know. Don't know. Why? Man, I, don't, I do not know how to read this room today. Because I thought maybe two people would have been offended about that, not 17. Some of y'all need to change your diet. What is wrong? I, I'm, I'm just saying... There's other options. Okay, for, okay, Pastor Charles, this is, learn from my lesson. Don't ever talk bad about Golden Corral. <laughs> they, they the, the rich were buying heads of donkeys to eat. And the poor were actually buying dove droppings. They, and, and it wasn't just to eat that, but they were trying, they would, they would process it and try to clean off the grain that was left. That's how bad it was. And, and then it, to make it even further, they were also resorting to cannibalism. There, were, there was a mother who, who got in agreement with another mother, and they said, well, if you boil your son, eat your son today, then we can boil my son and eat him tomorrow. I don't think we understand how bad it can get. I don't think as Americans, we do not understand how bad it can get. And so that's, that's the condition of Samaria right now. And so it's, there's no hope. There's no food. There's no future. There's nothing there. There's nothing but starvation and death. And so Elisha begins to prophesy to the king in verse one. It says, but Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord tomorrow about this time, a seah of fine flour should be sold for a shekel and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The captain on whose hand the king leaned said to the man of God, if the Lord himself should make windows in heaven, could this thing be? You will always receive doubt amongst a prophetic word. Whenever someone, whenever you receive a prophetic word, please don't go around telling people the prophetic word that you received because you will have people in your ear telling you that's not possible. If God himself created a window in heaven, there's no way that's going to happen to you in your life. He says that's not possible. But he said, talking about Elisha, he says, but you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. That's kind of scary. What he's saying is tomorrow the impossible will become possible. Even though we are, our circumstance is dire today, even though it feels like there's no help coming, even though it feels like we're all going to die, and even though it feels like we're all starving and there's no hope and no future, by this time tomorrow, our current situation is going to be flipped on the other side, and we're going to see something that we've never seen before. Yeah. 
Is anyone here right now facing a situation where it seems like you're, you're starving? It seems like you have no hope. It seems like you have no future. But I'm here to tell you, if you put your faith and trust in the Father, what seems like is impossible today will be made possible come tomorrow. That's how he works. And so it says in verse number three, now there were four men who were lepers at the entrance to the gate. Now, you see, they're lepers and they're at the entrance of the gate because they're not allowed in because they are lepers. You see, when you have leprosy, you, you cannot be around your family. You cannot be around anybody. And as a matter of fact, when someone will come up to you, you have to announce yourself that you have leprosy, like a unclean, unclean. And, and it would warn people to make sure they would walk on the other side of the road or to go around you because they don't want to have any contact with you. And so here they are. They're sitting at the entrance of the gate because they're not allowed in. So if you saw your friend Joe with leprosy, you'll go out there and be like, he'd be like hey, Jeremy, what's up? Like, hey, Joe. Where's your nose at, man? It's like, is that, I mean, that's how it was. And so when you would see someone with leprosy, the next time you see them, they will look even more disfigured. And so they were sitting by the gate and, and they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? You see, the four lepers are, are stuck outside the gates in between the city and this army are these four lepers. There's an army of Syria that has the entire city encircled. There's, there's a camp, there's a blockade, there's a siege. And so the lepers aren't allowed inside the city, but there's no safety inside the city because they can't go in the city. But yet on the other side, they look to their left, they see this giant army. And what they're saying is, why are we sitting here until we die? The question I want us to ask ourselves this morning is, why am I still here? You see, these lepers are sitting there. What they're saying is, why are we still here? Why are we still alive? You see, there's a, there's a siege here, and there's no food on the inside, and, and we're outcasts on the outside. Why are we still here? Meaning, they identify they still have a purpose. You see, because it doesn't matter what your past life was. It doesn't matter what you've done in your past. It doesn't matter what your sins are. And you can ask yourself this morning, why am I still here? Why am I still breathing? Why am I still walking? Why am I still doing what I'm doing? The purpose is that you still have a purpose. The reason why you're not dead is because you have a purpose. The reason why there's still air in your lungs is because you have a purpose. The reason why you're still walking on this planet is because you still have a purpose. But you might not have options. Please do not confuse options and purpose. You see, because these lepers had no options. It was either do we sit here or do we get up and go? Do we sit here until we die or do we identify that we have a purpose and we do something about it? So just because you may not have options, it doesn't mean that you don't have a purpose. As a matter of fact, God will begin to remove options from you to drive you to your purpose. Because if you have too many options, maybe you're too distracted. So if God will put you in a position where now you have fewer options and nothing else will to drive you but to your purpose. Amen. So before you complain about your lack of options, how about you celebrate that's just nothing more than pushing you to your purpose? Before you complain about how you don't know what else to do, it's just pushing you to your purpose. Before you complain about, I don't know what to do. I have nothing else to give. I have no options. It's just pushing you to your purpose. And so we have to ask ourselves the same question. Why am I still here? And you see, they have survived leprosy. But at this point, they have survived the siege and they have survived leprosy. And they're asking themselves, why am I still here? Now, even if you have a past life, and, and, and I don't know what you have survived, but here's the thing. If you have survived a divorce, you still have a purpose. You have survived addiction. You still have a purpose. You have survived a cheating lifestyle. You still have a purpose. I don't care what your past is. What I can tell you is that you still have a purpose regardless of your past. Still have a purpose regardless and it says in verse number four, if we say, let's enter the city, the famine is in the city. And if we shall die and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. 
So if we go into the city, well, one, they're going to kill us if we go in the city because we're not supposed to be in there. But if we sneak in and they don't recognize us, because everybody looks kind of jacked up right now during a siege, we might blend in. But there's no food in the city, so if they don't kill us, we're going to die anyhow. So if we sit here, we die also. So now come, let's go over to the camp of the Syrians. If they spare our lives, we shall live. But if they kill us, we shall but die. So they arose. They got, everybody say they got up. So they got up at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. But when they came to the edge of the camp of the Syrians, behold, there was no one there. You see, the next question we have to ask ourselves is, why do I do what I do? If we, can, if we can answer, why do I do what I do, it will lead us to our motivation. It will lead us to what motivates us in life. It will lead us to a place where we understand it's almost like Popeye and his spinach. As far as we, if we can identify what motivates us, now we have the fuel to get to our purpose. You see, because they were, they were stuck between two bad situations. And it was simply this. Do we go inside the city and die? Do we sit here and die? Or do we go to this foreign camp, this foreign army's camp? And chances are they're going to kill us too. But there's a greater chance that we might still live if they accept us. If we stay here, we 100% die. If we go in the city, we 100% die. But if we go to the enemy's camp, there is a 5% chance of survival. Even though I don't like those odds, 5% is still better than nothing. So let's go to a place that normally we'd be afraid of going to because we have purpose, but yet we have motivation. And the reason why is because they identified that there's something still worth living for. Here's the thing. I totally get the stuff. I, I, I totally understand as far as why we have, as far as the, the, the American dream, as far as like we, we have the cars and, and if we have the boats and we have all this. Kind of, I get all that. Please enjoy it. And, and enjoy this American dream that the people long for. But at the same time, what we have to understand is that even though we have a dream for some things, we have to have the motivation to get there. I don't know of anyone that's ever received anything by sitting on the couch. I remember one time I was, I, I was an avid baseball player. I, man, I love baseball. And, and my dad, he would never ground me. If I ever got in trouble, he would make me run around the house and do laps or do wall sets. That was my punishment. And one time he, he asked me if I wanted to go shacks and balls. I think because he just wanted to hit around. But he, he asked me if I wanted to go shacks and balls. And I said, no, I don't, I don't want to. And he looked at me. He goes, no one ever got great by sitting on the couch. And it wasn't a week later. I need to go practice basketball. Basketball season was coming. I'm like, Dad, you going to go play some ball? He goes, man, I got home from work. I'm tired, son. I go, no one ever got great. <laughs> I don't think I finished the sentence, but he understood what I was going to say. It's more like this. It's more like this. No one ever got great. <laughs> But to do, to, but to go through and find your purpose and to be motivated, it, it, it has to take courageous mindset. You have to be courageous in order to go through this. You see, it's because, think about parenting in 2024. I thank God that I wasn't a parent back when my kids were, when my parents were raising me. I wouldn't know what to do as far as them, but even now, as far as like, dear God, I don't know how to parent today. As far as with, because my parents have to deal with social media and everything else and having the world at your fingertips that's in your pocket. And so, like, so parenting in 2024 takes some courage. And, and, and it takes some courage to be a patient, to go into a doctor's office as you go in there for some, for some checkups on your testing, yet you're trying to encourage other people that's there. It also takes courage as an employee when you go into your office and all your coworkers are distracted and hate their jobs, but yet you're the one trying to encourage, but even though you're the most upset of all. 
you have a purpose. We have to be motivated, but it takes courage for us to go where God wants us to go. And it says in verse number six, the Lord had made the army of the Syrians hear the sound of chariots and of horses and the sound of a great army so that the, they said to one another, behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the king of the Hittites and the king of Egypt to come against us. So they fled in the twilight, abandoned their tents, their horses and their donkeys, leaving the camp as it was and fled for their lives. And when these lepers came to the edge of the camp, they went into a tent, they ate and they drank and they carried off silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. And then they came into the back and they entered another tent, carried off things, went from, went and hid them. You see, the mistake the lepers made was that they thought all the things that they were receiving was for them to enjoy. Oh my goodness. Look at all this gold. You see, it's easy to forget about people that put you out as an outcast. It's so easy to forget about the city that's starving behind you when they're the ones that wouldn't let you in to begin with, but yet you're sitting on the very solution that could solve the multitude of problems behind you. And so what they came to the conclusion was we're going to go take this gold and we're going to hide it. We're going to take this silver and we're going to hide it. We're going to eat. We're going to drink. We're going to have some fun. We're going to do this kind of stuff. But all of a sudden they have to ask themselves, why do I have what I have? I have, I have purpose, I'm still here. I had motivation to get to the camp, but now why do I have what I have? If you can answer why you have what you have, you now identify your resources. Why do I have what I have? Why do I have the American dream? Why do I have a car and why do I have a house and, and why do I have this and why do I have that? You see, you can get to the point to say, well, everything that I have was based off my hard work. The second you begin to think that, God will show you real quickly where that stuff came from. You were just the conduit. Your job was just the conduit for heaven to get you the things that God wanted to bless you with. And he can take that conduit away pretty quickly to show you where the blessings actually come from. And so what happens is that they, they begin to look at it and they, they have this, this idea as far as like, well, wait a second, I have the resources and I'm, I'm setting on the very solution because behind me there's a city that's on the brink of death. And regardless of what they did to me and regardless of how they pushed me out and regardless of how they wouldn't accept me, I still have to help them. I, I have the resources to help them. I'm sitting on the resources. And you see, but it's not just money that we can be selfish with. You see, it's easy for us to be selfish with money because that's, that's money. But I, I would say that there's something, there's one more thing that we are way more selfish with than our money. And that simply is our salvation. You see, because when you found Christ, you found the greatest resource of all. And a lot of the times we look back over our shoulder and we see a whole world that is starving and dying and going to hell. But yet we are refusing to share the good news of the gospel to those same people. So even though we want to be stingy about our money, we're way more stingy when it comes to the gospel. And so that's why we have to make sure that when we find something, we, when we ask ourselves, why do I have what I have or what do I have? We have the greatest gift of all. Those that have met Christ, we have salvation. And it says in verse number nine, then they said to one another, we are not doing right. I love how conviction works. Don't get me wrong. It stinks a lot of the times. But I love the process. I love how God can speak to me in the middle of the event and be like, stop it. <laughs> it it kind of stinks because I don't want to stop it. But he loves me enough to speak to me in the middle. And it said, they said, why are we, we are not doing good? This day is a day of good news. If we are silent and wait until the morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now, therefore, come, let's go tell the king's household 
What they're saying was that this is too good not to share. This is too good. We can't keep this a secret. If we share this with the city, we are sharing life. We can't keep this a secret. And if we keep this a secret, we're going to be punished for it. And so when you found Jesus, you were a leper. You were covered in sin, but you found something great for us to share. Because even in Psalms 107, verse 2, it says, see, it says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And so what that simply means is that we cannot be embarrassed about our testimony. When it talks about let the redeemed of the Lord say so, that means when you're standing next to somebody at Starbucks and they ask you why you're having such a good day, you can say, well, you don't know my story. Do you have just five seconds? Let me tell you about how once I was a drug dealer and I met Jesus one day and now all the addictions are gone. Can I once tell you that I cheated on my spouse every day of the week? I've been redeemed. Let me, let me tell you my redemption story. I have a story and it's full of redemption. You see, the lepers told those in the city about all the food and about the treasure. What do you think would happen when you go to a city that's in the middle of, of, of death and starvation? All of a sudden, you're like, hey, there's more food here than you could ever carry back. There's more gold here because see, the siege was happening was the Syrians brought their food. But when the traders and people come to Israel with their food, they were stopping them and taking their food too. So it wasn't just the Syrians brought all this food. Yes, they brought a food to feed an army, but they're also stockpiling all the stuff that's supposed to be in there to begin with. And so they tell the city this, and then it says in verse 16, then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Syrians. You see, if you can get past your pride and if you can get past the wrongdoings done to you, you are sitting on the solution for not just a person, but for an entire city. So a sea of flour was sold for a shekel and two seahs of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Now the king had appointed the captain whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. You remember the cat that said even the window in heaven couldn't do this? That guy? The king tells him, go take care of the gate. Probably not a good idea. Because now the king had appointed the captain on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. And the people trampled him in the gate. So he died. Elisha ain't no liar. You're going to see. You ain't going to eat. Exactly what happened. He saw it. He didn't eat. So that he died as the man of God has said when the king came down to him. So on that day, there was people inherited food and freedom. They had food and they had freedom, but there was also a job opening that was created. The man that got trampled on, now all of a sudden there's a posting on Craigslist, now hiring. Someone that the king can lean on to hear messages. You see, God specializes in radical redemption. And I'm trying to wrap up. If I can have five more minutes, I promise I'm wrapping up. God specializes in radical redemption that always seems improbable. Do you know why the lepers said to themselves, we must go tell somebody or bad things are going to happen to us? Because according to rabbinical texts, these four lepers were none other than Gehazi and his three sons. See, Gehazi took the gold and the silver and the clothes and he hid them. And then we fast forward where now he's at a camp and he has the gold and the silver and the clothes and he hides them. But yet when Elisha says, you're going to have leprosy and your descendants are going to have leprosy, immediately his sons and himself, all four had leprosy. And the reason why they stopped themselves is because they were back in the same spot again. And one of them probably said, Daddy, do you remember last time he did this? Wait, wait, wait. Hey, do you remember the last time I did this? Why well, I, I, I'm not going to do this again. I'm not going to be selfish again. We have to go tell somebody. So it was Gehazi and his three sons who were the lepers. And I know you don't believe me. That's fine. I know you don't believe me, but here's my proof. You see, because Elisha, remember that Shumanite woman that he that he that the woman built the, the room for him and, and he prophesied about the son and the son died and he laid on the son, the son came back to life. Well, Elisha also told her to go away for seven years because there was a famine. 
her husband died. And it's her and her son, and they come back to the king to petition to get her stuff back. Second Kings chapter number eight, verse three. And at the end of seven years, when the woman returned from the land of the Philistines, she went to appeal to the king for her house and for her land. Now the king was talking with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, tell me all the great things that Elisha has done. There's no way that Elisha would have cursed him and he got leprosy and he would stand before the king with leprosy. The only way Gehazi would stand before the king is if he was healed. The reason why he got his healing is because he was radically redeemed. Because God says, you bless Israel, now I bless you. You bless Israel, now I bless your children. You bless Israel, I'm pulling back the curse. He's standing next to the king. He would have had no business next to him if he still had leprosy. That's the proof. That's the proof. He was cursed with leprosy until he stopped and said, we're going to take this and share it with God's people. And the second he shared it with God's people, the leprosy lifted off Gehazi, and now he's standing next to the king, and he is holding the same position of the man that doubted that was once trampled at the gate. The job opening that was created by doubt is now being filled by a person with faith. And he stands there with, and he's telling all these stories to the king about Elisha. Well, I saw Elisha do this. He, he, there was once a pot of stew that was poisoned, and Elisha cured the stew. There was once an, an ax head that floated in the water that he pulled up, and, and there was a woman that was once had a child who was dead, and Elisha brought him back. Whew. And he was talking to the king about how Elisha restored the dead to the life. And behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life appealed to the king for her house and her hand. And Gehazi said, my Lord, O king, here is the woman and her son whom Elisha restored to life. The purpose of Gehazi wasn't that he would be healed of leprosy. It was the fact that there was a woman with a son that was coming back to the king and God needed someone to validate the story of Elisha. So God lifted the leprosy of Gehazi, promoted him next to the king, and he's vouching and telling the stories of Elisha. And as he's telling the story of the Shumanite woman, here she comes walking in at the exact same time. Same time, you have a purpose. You have a purpose. You see, Gehazi's story, I'm sure he would love to skip over the part where he stole the gold and the silver and the clothes. I'm sure he would love to skip over the leprosy. And I'm sure he would love to skip over the point of being rejected. But all of it was part of his story. Because if it wasn't for the leprosy, if it wasn't for the siege, he wouldn't be standing next to the king. Acts 3, 19, repent, then turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Never allow an embarrassment of your past sin to hold you hostage. Never allow it to hold you hostage to a life of wandering and regret. God is after one thing, a change of heart and character in us. That's what he's after. If you're tired of living outside the camp, outside of God's blessing, goodness, and power, I invite, I invite you to allow God to join you in your life. You are still here for a reason. Your story isn't finished. You still have chapters left to be written. You still have chapters. Hebrews tells us that Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. If we could all stand, I'm closing with this. And I'm kind of torn right now on what I'm feeling because I'm feeling two different things. 
And I think the best way for us to do is I just wanted, I just want every head bowed, every because like this is going to be a sacred moment. And I want people here. I, I don't want anyone to look around. Pastor Charles is here. We have some pastors here. And so I there's complete freedom. There's no judgment. No one is looking. Nobody is looking because every head's bowed and every eye closed. I just and I, I just want I just want to speak to you and ask you this question. If you have never experienced the love of the Father, if you have never had an encounter with Jesus, I just want you to raise your hand. Thank you. We can keep them up, keep them up, keep them up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, you can put them down. Here's the thing. We have people here that's never encountered the love of Jesus. But we also have people here who feel like their purpose is now gone. You once found him, but now you don't know what you're doing. You once had him, but now you feel lost. You once had him, but now you find yourself sitting outside the gate. I'm gonna ask our prayer team to come this morning and they're just gonna come up here to the front. And, and this is what I wanna do. If, if you simply have never ever felt the love of the Father, if you have never felt the love of the Father, if you've never met Jesus, I'm gonna ask you to come. It's almost like the lepers getting up out of, of where they were. It's a leper standing up and going to the gift. This is the same thing as an act of faith, as an act of declaration. If you've never met the Father, I'm gonna ask you to come. We're gonna pray with you. We, we, it, we, so we won't be crazy when being like, like that. We just wanna just pray with you. But if you find yourself right now where you feel like you're lost and you, you're, you're struggling with purpose and you're struggling with what you should do next, I'm gonna ask you to come and let one of these awesome people pray with you because you can leave this place today knowing Jesus. You can leave this place today having purpose. You can leave this place today having motivation. As they play and as they sing, give God a hand clap of praise if you receive that word this morning. Give us a praise this morning. If you need purpose, come on down. If you want to meet Jesus, come on down. Our prayer team is up here.